Um, what I'm interested in this morning is how we see the Holocaust, how we perceive it, where we get our information from, which stories we tell. And I'm going to use this as a, as a way in to uh, introducing some key aspects of the new Holocaust galleries to you. Uh, we're not going to try and cover everything, but I hope I'll give you an interesting glimpse and I very much hope you and your students will choose to visit uh, when we open at the end of June. Um, so I'm interested in also what kinds of um, preconceptions, what sorts of knowledge, what kinds of uh, expectations your students might have uh, before coming to this exhibit. And I'd also love to hear a little bit from all of you, even though we can only do this through the chat, uh, just to give you a, a chance to, to chip in here and guide a little bit how this is going to unfold and develop. I'd be interested to know with your students, what would they expect to see in a new Holocaust exhibit, do you think? Um, I don't mean that I'm not, it's not a test, of course, I'm saying not expecting them to be experts in this history, but rather, what do they know from maybe some lessons that you've taught, but perhaps more likely um, could even be films that they've watched, books they've read, things that they've heard. The Holocaust is a large part of our popular discourse today, often gets uh, used, sometimes misused for different agendas. What would they have heard of the Holocaust? And what would they expect to see in these galleries? So anything you think you, your students, any of these questions here, what was the Holocaust? What happened in it? When and where did it take place? If you were to be asking your 14, 15, 16 year olds these questions, who was involved? Or maybe even what was the role of the United States? What kinds of uh, a collective picture do you think we would get? What would our collective memory begin to um, to look like here. So if you just like to pop some of those thoughts into the chat. Depends on the grade for sure. I don't know the role of the US I'm seeing there. And Frank has mentioned people that lost their their lives. You know, the U.S. was that of a liberator. Someone likes the question about the U.S. That's good. Jews were put into camps um, and ovens by the Nazis. U.S. saved the Jews. Hitler was a cruel leader. Um, they would know the basics of what happened, but not the specifics. The where, the when, the role of the U.S., etc. Okay. Nazi Germany and Anne Frank is mentioned. What terrified, um, sorry, it's moved on quite quickly. Some have read Mouse. Some might know about Jews, but not other victims. Okay. Anne Frank and Mouse, Eddie Wiesel. Innocent people lost their lives. Concentration camps, boy in the striped pajamas. Okay, great. Hitler killed many Jewish people. Okay, fine. So um, when we've asked this kind of question in uh, surveys, both uh, national surveys that I've been involved in in the UK and many other um, surveys of, of historical knowledge of the Holocaust in many other countries, including the US, um, there tends to be a lot of interest in the Holocaust and um, some basic knowledge, as some of you are saying, uh, and it tends to be not very deep, though, um, which, you know, even for, with those that have studied it um, in quite a few lessons or visited exhibitions. Uh, what was the Holocaust and what happened? We could kind of summarize this from the research. I'm not saying everyone would think this or necessarily your students, but that um, they'll be thinking of during the Second World War, that era, if they're putting a date on it. Hitler and the Nazis will get mentioned. Where did it happen? Probably thinking Germany predominantly rather than Europe as a, as a continent. Um, they're thinking of uh, concentration camps, gas chambers, um, Jews being murdered in their millions. Sometimes they'll mention other victims as well. This is the kind of picture. Um, and so it might be a good place 
to start, right, as we begin to talk about this new Holocaust exhibit, um, the idea of if they mention any concentration camps or any death camps, probably Auschwitz is the one which is, which is predominant. Uh, so if we were to begin with this image, which is a photograph of crematorium three in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, Auschwitz was the largest of all the German Nazi concentration camps across German-occupied Europe. Uh, it was such a vast camp, there were actually three major parts to it, Auschwitz I, Auschwitz II, where this was, Birkenau, and Auschwitz III, Bunamonowitz, a large uh, industrial slave labor camp. Um, and uh, maybe, well, more than 40 subcamps in an area covering some 16 square miles. So it's a truly huge complex, not just a single place. Uh, but we chiefly associate Auschwitz as a death camp with the gas chambers and crematoria. In Birkenau, there were four specialized crematoria that were created, Auschwitz uh, crematoria two, three, four, and five. Um, and these, this is the kind of, if, if you like, the, I suppose the high point of the technological means of mass murder, because it's not just a question or a problem for the killers as to how to kill vast numbers of people, but how to dispose of the bodies of those, um, those huge numbers. And so combining gas chambers with crematoria was the kind of final stage of the development of an ongoing process of mass murder. And this is its culmination. This was being built in April of 1943. And uh, in Auschwitz-Birkenau, um, some 1.3 million people were deported to uh, Auschwitz, about 1.1 million perished there, they were murdered there, and about 90% of them, some 1 million people were Jewish men, women, and children who were killed uh, chiefly in the, in the gas chambers uh, within hours of their arrival. Um, so this is part of that process of what we're seeing here, part of that technology of, of death and mass murder. And it might be something that our students, even with basic knowledge, might be expecting to find out about. Um, a number of things I want to say about this. Uh, this photograph is taken uh, by the SS themselves. It's taken by the perpetrators. And that's a starting point when we think about how we represent the Holocaust uh, in public museums, in books, in films, in teaching, in classrooms, we are predominantly resting, relying upon the perspective of the perpetrators, of the killers. Most of the documentary evidence we have, most of the photographs uh, that survive come from that side. So we're looking through the lens of the killers when we, and we're forced to share their gaze in this kind of a photograph. So that's just one um, point to put out that when I asked in the, the title of this, of this uh, presentation was the Holocaust through whose eyes, very often we are forced to share that gaze of the, the killers or the perpetrators themselves. And that's problematic, of course. Uh, but it's also, we do have rich testimonies from survivors. We do have even some documentary evidence. There were um, Zonderkommando, Jewish prisoners working inside these gas chambers and crematoria that although they themselves were murdered, wrote secretly, clandestinely notes and documents about the process and buried them in the very ashes of Auschwitz itself discovered after the war. We have some sketches, some drawings. We even have a few photographs um, from a smuggled camera uh, that the, the victims themselves took. So there are precious items, but few of them compared to the picture that we get from the perpetrator side. The other challenge that we have when we're talking, thinking, studying the Holocaust, is that um, despite so much evidence does survive, so much of it was also destroyed. Um, this is a story of mass murder and of the destruction of people, vast numbers of people and communities and ways of life that were destroyed in Europe forever. But they're also it's also a story of the destruction of uh, the evidence as the killers uh, realized that the war was turning against them and as they were in retreat, um, they destroyed as much as they could. So they killed the, the last witnesses, as, as many of them as they were able. They blew up the gas chambers and crematoria. They burnt documents. So this building no longer exists. And this, the other reason I mention this now, and I begin the, the session with this discussion, is because we also live in a time of Holocaust denial, 
and of Holocaust distortion. You know, how do we really know what we know about the past? And what I want to say about a visit to a, a museum exhibition, such as the one opening in the Museum of Jewish Heritage, is that it's the first time for many people that they're able to see the material evidence of these crimes displayed in front of their eyes. So although we do have photographs like this, one of the first objects that your students will encounter is a brick from that same building. This is a brick from Crematorium 3, from Auschwitz-Birkenau. Despite the building was destroyed, there is material evidence that that building existed, not only this photographic evidence. And this is one of the things which is presented to visitors, this um, very, uh, tactile, of course, is very uh, physical piece of evidence of these mass crimes. So some of this material is, is it looks quite um, ordinary in a sense, right? It's just a brick, but its provenance and the role that it played, the fact that this was being built in April 1943 and this particular brick was part of that construction and it remains with us today, it's something which was there at the time, which remains in the present, is a strong evidence of the, of the crimes themselves. And beginning with this, I also wanted to begin with that year of April 1943, because although this is the kind of thing which your students might expect, at least to learn about, the gas chambers and crematoria of Auschwitz, they may not expect to see an actual remnant of that very building, and be so close to it, and I think that has a very strong, evocative, powerful resonance for many people. But there are other pieces of evidence from the same time, the same moment in time, if you like, which will perhaps be more unexpected. And in the same room, a very early room in the exhibition, alongside this discussion of what Auschwitz became, you'll see this illustration from a pamphlet an advertisement, a program for a um, pageant that took place in New York City itself. So not far from um, the Museum of Jewish Heritage in Madison Square Garden, right, in Manhattan. So although we are thousands of miles away with this brick from uh, Auschwitz in German occupied Poland, which we bring to the museum and display with this uh, material evidence, we're also very close because if you look at the date on this of March 1943, this is just before that building is coming into operation. And what it tells us, and what this pageant tells us, is that surprisingly for many people, knowledge of the Holocaust was actually very well known. There was good, accurate information. This drawing you can see is dated December 1942 by Arthur Schick. So the knowledge of what was happening was being reported in the US as early as 1942. What, what many historians have called the year of killing. 42 is a um, the beginning of 1942, 80% of all Jewish people that would be murdered in the Holocaust were still alive. A year later, 80% of them were already dead. So this year is critical. And as those killings were taking place, news was getting out to the outside world, to Britain, to the United States, elsewhere it was being reported on it was known about so in terms of what was the role of the US or what was the role of Britain or the Allies this raises a question which for many people doesn't really occur because they assume perhaps that either um, the Allies fought the war to save the Jews which of course they did not or that they didn't really know what was happening until they entered the concentration camps as liberators at the end, because it was kept so secret, which it was not. There were attempts to keep it secret, but that news got out. So this contrast, this juxtaposition between the brick, the crematoria of, of Auschwitz, and the knowledge of these things happening as they were taking place, also coincides in the same month, if the same year of April 1943, with the destruction of the largest Jewish community in Europe at that time. So in Warsaw, the capital city of Poland before the Second World War, if you walk the streets of, of Warsaw, every third person, one in three people that you met in the streets was Jewish. More than 300,000 people yeah, out of a population of about 1 million, 
were Jews. Um, by the time of April 1943, the ghetto, which is a small, just over 2% of the town streets, um, hemmed off, walled off, crowded, uh, the, those, that third of the population crowded into that tiny space where, of course, vast numbers of them, almost 100,000, die of starvation and disease. But by the um, summer of 1942, they're also being deported en masse to a death camp of Treblinka, so that by April 43, only 60,000 of them remain alive. When the German uh, forces go into the, um, uh, the Warsaw Ghetto on the 19th of April, with the intention of finally liquidating and murdering all the remaining inhabitants, the first uh, mass uprising, first urban uprising anywhere in Europe takes place, and the Jews of Warsaw fight back. Now, again, the reason I'm mentioning this is that much of what happens in this exhibition is deliberately created or presented in such a way as to shake the kind of foundations of what people think they know. The very common question about the Holocaust is why didn't they fight back? So in, again, one of the first rooms of the exhibition, before a long kind of chronological explanation of how the Holocaust took place, which will unfold through the exhibition. But to begin with, we're there in April 43. We're there with the um, crescendo of Auschwitz, the, the building of these gas chambers and crematoria. We're there in the same month with the destruction of the people of the Warsaw Ghetto, but of those Jewish men, women and children fighting back, taking up arms and fighting for about a month against flamethrowers and machine guns and tanks. You can see the destruction of the ghetto happening here. Um, it was said that the, the, the fires were so intense that the, the places, the pavements melted, right? So the, this enormously intense um, period of fighting taking place at the same time as in New York, this pageant is taking place, um, trying to alert people to knowledge of what was happening in Europe. And that um, public outcry pressured the British and the Americans, diplomats from each of those countries who can be seen here, um, the, the uh, going from left to right, you have a British delegate, an American delegate, Howard Dodds, um, Richard Law, the head of the British delegation, another American delegate from New York, actually, and um, finally another British delegate. Now they're meeting uh, at a conference in Bermuda again in the same month, April 1943, to discuss what could be done to help more Jews um, survive this onslaught from the Nazis, which was, as I keep emphasizing, extremely well known at this particular point in time. How could the Allies or should the Allies do more to accept Jewish refugees. This is emerging out of those sorts of protests, such as that one in Madison Square Gardens in New York and elsewhere, lots of campaigning in, in Britain and across the rest of the US also. These delegates are meeting on the same day, the actual day that the Warsaw Ghetto breaks out, just coincidentally, the 19th of April. The next day though, the British delegate, pictured there in the middle, Richard Law, worries, well, supposing we offer to take these Jewish refugees, what would happen if Hitler accepted? If he accepted a proposal to release perhaps millions of unwanted persons? We, said Richard Law, might find ourselves in a very difficult position. He, Hitler, might say, all right, take a million or two million. Then because of the shipping problem and all the other logistics, where do you take people, where do you house them, how do you feed them, we should be made to look exceedingly foolish, said Richard Law in his hotel conference on the island of Bermuda with his American colleagues. So they knew what was taking place, they discussed what more could have been done, and this was their concern. The very next day, Going, returning to Warsaw and that ghetto that has been now beginning to be fought, that ghetto uprising for two days, the very next day, the following day of the 21st of April, a secret transmitter sent a message from the ghetto, from the inhabitants of the ghetto, picked up by a Swedish intercept. And that last message 
before to start to describe the fighting going on in the ghetto and before it cut out the final two words before it went dead to the outside world was save us in bermuda though the only item on the agenda was how could they help 5000 jews who'd already reached spain spain was neutral those jews were already safe the only outcome was to take 630 of those Jews from neutral Spain to North Africa. Those people were not already, were not by that time at threat of death anyway. So this gathering of British and American delegates in Bermuda ended without saving a single Jewish person. What does that say to us about knowledge of the time, of, um, of what was understood, of what decisions were taken, and how does that position the allies vis-a-vis -vis our um, collective memory that we fight the war either to save the Jews or we at least come in as liberators? What does that do to that kind of picture? Back in Warsaw, after the fighting of lasting, as I say, one month, the ruins of the ghetto in rubble. And Going from Auschwitz to Warsaw, a detachment, a group of prisoners from Auschwitz were taken to clear up the ruins of the ghetto. The 60,000 people had been de defeated, of course. Most of them sent to Treblinka and murdered. Others were taken to Majdanek and they were killed there in November um, of 43 uh, as a um, kind of final reprisal for other escapes elsewhere. Um, almost all of them are murdered a, a few survivors of the warsaw ghetto that survived the war but this rich culture which had lasted for hundreds of years in the heart of europe was utterly destroyed as i said one in three people you met in warsaw before the war would have been jewish you'd have heard yiddish spoken in the streets there were synagogues across the city there were jewish theaters there were jewish cinemas there was jewish music there was jewish literature if you walk the streets of Warsaw today, you could walk all day and never meet a Jewish person. But this detachment clearing up the rubble, one of the men from Auschwitz, Shlomo Schlesinger, as he moves these, this rubble, discovers this talit, this religious man's prayer shawl amongst the rubble, and at great risk to himself, he salvages it, the trace of that community that had been destroyed, a trace of those that had led this uprising, fought in this uprising perhaps, and a mark of his own resistance by trying to keep a trace of those people alive. He uh, managed to eventually escape and join the Polish underground um, and he survived the war and kept that talit with him. Now, all of those things, all of these items and all of these stories are collected together and displayed in one of the earliest rooms of the new exhibition. And the reason is to try and shake this idea of a kind of simple, inevitable storyline, a single timeline. Hitler becomes um, chancellor in January 1933. The Holocaust unfolds over the next 12 years. It ends in 45 you know, and it, and it proceeds in this kind of linear way. History, the world, of course, our world is not like that. It's much more complex, many different things overlapping and happening at the same time. Connections being made at the same moment in time, but thousands of miles apart. We're moving from Warsaw and Oswinchim, Auschwitz in German-occupied Poland um, to Bermuda, to New York, yeah, to Britain, to America, um, and pulling all of this together, this knowledge and these, these separate but connected events, um, and also showing, we hope, a different way of seeing the Holocaust, not only through the eyes of the perpetrators, and we have to understand their ideology and their motives and the reasons for their actions if we're going to explain the Holocaust, but we also want to understand what was known by others. What did others see? What did they understand? How did they react and how did they behave? And we want to show that Jews 
and other victims were not just a passive mass. We want to rehumanize them. We want to show them as individual people with agency and to show that genocide is not just something that happens to people as objects, but rather they are subjects trying to understand and respond as best they can. Moving from many different places over a wide geographical terrain across continents, I now want to move and narrow down to a single item, but to think about that through a kind of temporal lens. So one of the ways which we can create a more complex picture of the Holocaust is through its geography. Another way is through a better understanding of how it unfolds over time. So here we're presented with a single object, um, this hand embroidered blouse, which was um, embroidered by the woman in the photograph on your right, the one on the right hand side, Haya Porus, shown here with her sister Rivka. And it was um, embroidered for their other sister, Rachel Porus, at the time of the family being incarcerated into a ghetto in, um, in Lithuania, uh, which now is under German occupation also. Rachel, who was given this as a gift by her sister, Haya, uh, was a midwife before the war and a nurse in the ghettos tending the sick. I mentioned already the overcrowded conditions, the hunger, the disease. She was seen as a kind of angel of mercy, if you like. And her sister, Haya, the one pictured in this photograph, um, hand-stitched, hand-embroidered this blouse and gave it to her as a present. So one story we could be telling through this is the story of the ghetto and of people's resilience, their love for each other, their fa familial ties, and also the work of people in terms of self-help and helping others, such as this nurse, Rachel, who wore this in the ghetto and tended the sick. It's a powerful story in and of itself. But the thing is, with the, because the history unfolds over time and the object remains with the family through this period, and of course it remains with us today in the um, Museum of Jewish Heritage, it passes through that time and its, its story changes and perhaps the meaning changes. Because in its return to April 1943 again, family are deported from their smaller ghetto, they think they're going to the Vilna ghetto, a much larger ghetto in the kind of capital city of, of Lithuania today, Vilnius. Um, but actually en route on that train, Haya is warned to jump from the train, which she does. So the woman on the right hand side of that picture um, jumps from the train and actually makes her way to the ghetto, the Vilna ghetto, and, and, and is, is there. The train though continues to um, the forest nearby uh, Vilnius, the forest of Ponar, where the people are taken from the train and forced to strip um, and are shot into mass pits, um, mass murder. So a huge amount of the killings of the Holocaust are not done in gas chambers, but are done by shooting, face-to-face um, uh, -face killing, um, men, women, and children shot to death into these mass graves. The woman who had been wearing this blouse, Rachel Porus, was amongst them. When she undressed, this was amongst her belongings. Someone who was one of the Jewish people given the task of collecting the belongings, recognized the blouse, understood that Haya had got to the Vilnius ghetto and managed to return it to her in that ghetto. So the blouse that she had embroidered for her sister now becomes a memento of that murdered sister. And is with Haya in the Vilnius ghetto. So is the story we should tell the one of the mass shootings? Because we can only place this object once in the exhibition. Yeah, it can only sit in one room. It can only be in one display case. So where this is a challenge that, you know, as curators, we have to decide where does this go? What story does it tell? But the story doesn't end there either because Haya, now with the blouse herself, escapes from Vilnius and joins the partisans in the forests um, of uh, Eastern Europe, the forest nearby to Vilnius, 
and forms a or is part of a partisan group uh, called Nakama or Revenge in Hebrew, fighting the Germans. And there were some 30,000 Jewish partisans fighting the Nazis from the forests of Eastern Europe. A story which is often undertold. You know, when people ask why didn't they fight back, it neglects the fact that so many people did resist, so many people did fight back, as we saw in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, as we see again here through this blouse. But that's a different story, right? So is that the story we tell and how she survives the forest and how she continues to patch up this um, blouse in the forest and keeps it with her as a memento of her sister? And of course, eventually gives it to the Museum of Jewish Heritage where it's now on display. So when you come to the exhibition with your students, look for the blouse and see where we decided to place it, but also which stories were attached to it and how we tried to integrate and weave stories together that take place over quite a period of time, even though we can only show it in one single place. So we've got the spatial dimension, the geographical dimension of the Holocaust, a continent-wide genocide, um, many different things taking place at the same moment in different places. And we've got the temporal dimension, that challenge of how do we tell this story over time? And how do we make this accessible to our audiences and, and to your students? Moving from this blouse, I'd like you to think, you know, why that kind of care and attention to the embroidery? What does it mean to us to put on our clothes in the morning? What clothes did you get dressed in today? Do your, did you choose your, the shoes to match your outfit when you went out um, for the last evening, you, when you went to a theatre or to a restaurant? Do you, um, how do you cut your hair? Do you wear jewellery? Do you have your ears pierced, right? How do we present ourselves to the world? How do we want to be seen? What does it say about our identity? What does it mean to be comfortable in our clothes? What does it mean to be clean? And then think about this dress, which was given to an 18-year-old Jewish young woman from Hungary, Rose Safro, when she arrived in Auschwitz on a cattle car with thousands of others, not knowing really where she was, arriving on the ramp of Auschwitz-Birkenau and several thousand people being divided into two large groups, men and older boys on one side, women and young children on the other, walking towards a Nazi doctor who decides for each of them in turn, do they go into the work camp where their life expectancy was just a few weeks if they were Jews? Or are they murdered on arrival in the gas chambers within hours of arriving at Auschwitz, which was true for typically 80% or more of them. This young woman, because she was healthy and strong looking, was chosen for work in the camp. But all the clothes that she arrived in were stripped from her. All the possessions that she arrived with, the pots and pans, the photographs, mementos from home, any jewellery which she had, everything taken from her, everything looted. The hair was cut from her head. Women's hair would be reused to um, weave into fabric to make carpets or to uh, use as insulation or could be used to make socks for U-boat submarine crews, German submarine crews everything people brought with them. The mouths of the dead were plundered to pull the gold teeth from their mouths and melted down, right? Everything was stolen from them. And what she's thrown, what she's given, is an ill-fitting garment, probably taken from one of the dead inmates. So usually filthy. It could be, uh, have blood traces on it, vomit, feces, no underwear. Women given nothing um, to uh, for their sanitary needs um, when they have their, their period. Um, no way of getting washed, no way of getting clean. This dehumanizing process, where everything is taken from them. And this is another process which we see happening throughout the Holocaust, where everything which makes a life worth living 
your friendships and your um, family, your loved ones taken from you at that moment of selection, your clothes stripped from you, your hair shaved off your head, your name taken, a tattoo placed on your arm. This every single aspect of ma what made you you being removed, including even your own name, your work. You know what job did you do before the war? What status did that give you? What fulfillment did it give you? Now work becomes a way of murdering people. People are literally worked to death. Food becomes so scarce that people are on starvation rations. So the joy of sitting together and eating a meal together, conversation, is, you know, everything is destroyed. When you feel unwell or you're tired at night, you go to bed and you pull up your blankets and you cuddle yourself down or you hold your lover. Now in places like the concentration camps like Auschwitz, it's a hard bunk with maybe a thin blanket to keep you warm, even in freezing conditions where you are lying with the dead and the dying. Where people are crammed in. Even sleep is taken from you from what it meant before. Every process of what it meant to be you is removed. This is what she's wearing. She survived and she kept this. Also um, in Auschwitz, Margit uh, Rosenfeld, a, a, another inmate of um, Auschwitz, cuts a piece of leather from her shoe and takes thread from her clothing to fashion this pendant. So even as we see the degradation and the dehumanization. And it's too easy for us to unwittingly reduce the victims to this kind of faceless mass. If we take time and pay attention to how they responded and what they did, here we see the remarkable resilience of a woman who risks a, at least a severe beating, perhaps even death, to retain some kind of trace of who she was before. Well, elsewhere, in a subcamp of Stutthof, with those starvation rations, one young woman, Esther Heitlin, receives a knife, this battered, scratched, not very ornate um, utility, uh, utensil from a German guard. Occasionally things were given out. And she uses it to cut the loaves of bread that she receives and with her mother and her three sisters to share it out evenly. What does it mean to share your food when you're amongst the starving and the dead? What does that mean about retaining your, hum your humanity? How does this become another symbol of resistance or at least of resilience, as with this Star of David, which we should remember and place alongside those other responses of armed uprisings that we see with the partisans in the forest or the uh, ghetto revolt in Warsaw. How does this shake our students' understanding and image of what genocide means and of how people respond as such crimes unfold? Elsewhere, we speak a lot about the concentration camps, of course, but as well as the thousands of concentration camps, and the, and, the, and the many ghettos and the subcamps of the concentration camps um, were six death camps. And actually the vast majority of Jews were never registered into a concentration camp because they were taken to a killing center where they were murdered on arrival. This man, Haim Posner, who as a teenage boy, age 15, had been given these to fill in um, a religious artifact, a religious um, object, which uh, orthodox men would tie and bind around um, their arm or on their across around their head to on their have uh, the prayer um, contained within on their forehead as they said blessings. This was given to him when he was fifteen years old, and he was told by the rabbi who gave it to him to always keep it with him. He retained it with him even when he was sent to Sobibor one of those six death camps. 
he managed to conceal it in his long underwear. He managed to hide it from the guards and their auxiliaries, and he buried it in a tin on the grounds of Sobibor. In Sobibor, 167,000 people at least were murdered. But in October of 1943, again, a sign of resistance, even within the death camp, there was an uprising. As there was in Auschwitz, as there was in Treblinka. And some 300 of the inmates of Sobibor managed to break out. They killed some of the guards, they got through the, the wire, they crossed the minefield, they made for the forest. Um, many of them were killed in the attempt. Others were hunted down. Out of those 300 escapees, only 50 survived the war. Posner, who had dug up that tin days before the uprising, know it was, knowing it was coming and, and desperate to keep them with him, escaped and was one of the 50 out of 167,000 people murdered in um, Treblinka, uh, sorry, in Sobibor, that survived that death camp, one of those few witnesses. And this is an object from that death camp, from one of those survivors. And his testimony also um, is shown and given in the new core exhibition. A different form of response, a different form of resilience, another form of, um, of, of revolt against the Nazis' attempts to dehumanize and murder. Now, I say only 50 of 167,000 survived um, so people, that, that's not um, uncommon. For the, for the death camps, that's the normal story. In Belgettes, for example, some 450,000 people are murdered. Just two people survived. And one of them was killed shortly after the war. We have one testimony from Belgettes. So I return to that question, through whose eyes do we see the Holocaust? We are overwhelmingly dependent, of course, on the perpetrators' documents, stories and accounts, and they're needed in order to explain what happened and how and why. But we also need to understand who these people were that were murdered, the communities that were destroyed, and to understand something of them pre-war, um, of their lives, of their work, of their loves, of their hopes and their dreams. Because if you don't understand what was destroyed, how can you begin to appreciate what was lost? So through the eyes of the victims, through the eyes of the survivors, through these remnants, these artifacts, these precious few um, survivors, uh, we also tell that story. And to end, and as a, I hope a strong contrast with the dress of Rose Safra that she was given in, um, in Auschwitz, we have another survivor, Franja Blatt, who um, survived a death march, uh, who was liberated um, by the American army uh, and soldiers gave them bolts of cloth. When she was um, liberated, she weighed just 60 pounds, the average weight of an eight-year-old child. And the soldier that saw her and her sister said, my God, children are here. She, was, she and her sister were 26 and 27 years old, but they were so starved, they were so small, they were so hungry, they were so close to death, they'd lost so much weight, he mistook them for children. She, as she brought herself back to life with the, the bolts of cloth that she was given, she made this, what we might call liberation dress. And you can see stitched into it some panels as it was let out, as she put on weight again. And a year later, she's wearing that dress in the displaced placement camp, still in Europe, with her new daughter Tova in 1946. It's a, in some ways a, um, a symbol of hope, but we shouldn't see an image like this and assume that things were restored. The vast majority of survivors were utterly alone in the world. They couldn't, they had no home to return to. They had no community left. Um, 
they found solace with each other. They found comfort with each other and they tried to rebuild. But many of them, of course, had children before who were murdered. And many of them never recovered, even though they attempted to rebuild the lives as best they could. And throughout Europe, as I said today, in towns which were had once thriving communities, you can now walk those streets and not see a single Jewish person. This is how we, part of the way we, we bring the exhibition to a close and it's where I'll leave this presentation now and um, invite, if we have time, to offer any questions, thoughts or comments. But thank you so much for your attention. Really appreciate it.